with promiscuity as well as the abuse of substances such as alcohol on the rise, mixed with a desire for a drama-rich environment to be satiated by dark triad men. This is a recipe for frequent bouts of unprotected sex, resulting in heightened chances of exposure to potentially dangerous bacteria as well as viruses. While people kindly acknowledge that penetrative sex runs on the risk of being exposed to infections, there is sometimes a disconnect when it comes to oral sex. Like the religious teens who, in attempts at finding a loophole to religious doctrine when it comes to premarital sex, people, well, find another hole. As I recall someone putting it, and I quote, doing it in the butt for Jesus. Of course, this supposed loophole still runs down the risk of exposure to bacteria and therefore infection. Similarly, men, and women for that matter, who engage in oral sex, likely unbeknownst to them and thinking that they are being safe, perhaps having found some form of loophole, can actually be exposing themselves to dangerous bacteria as well as viruses linked to cancer. Getting straight to the point is one early 2023 article titled, Oral sex is now the leading risk factor for throat cancer, which sheds light on the fact that throat cancer in the West has increased to such a significant extent that it has been referred to as an epidemic. Human papillomavirus, or HPV for short, is known to be the primary cause of a form of throat cancer called oropharyngeal cancer, but also cervical cancer. As HPV is passed to others during intercourse, unsurprisingly, the prevalence of this form of throat cancer has been found to increase with the number of lifetime oral sex partners people had. More specifically, as the article states, those with six or more lifetime oral sex partners are 8.5 times more likely to develop oral pharyngeal cancer than those who do not practice oral sex. In a separate article titled, You Can't Get Cancer from Oral Sex, But It May Increase Your Risk, it essentially restates a bit of the information from the previous article, but the author's main point is that oral cancer isn't contagious. It isn't something you can get from having oral sex, but you could experience exposure to sexually transmitted infections like human papillomavirus that can increase your risk of developing oral pharyngeal cancer later in life. Like the other article, the author emphasizes that HPV has been the most commonly linked sexually transmitted infection with oral cancer but also a useful bit of information which may do away with this disconnect people harbor when it comes to oral sex and the transmission of infections. Gonorrhea, herpes, HPV, syphilis, chlamydia, HIV, hepatitis, general warts, and even pubic lice can be transmitted through oral sex as is known to be the case with penetrative sex. Interestingly, in a study titled Oral Pharyngeal Cancer Epidemic in Human Papillomavirus, the methods by which HPV can be spread is expanded in the author's acknowledgement that it has also been reported that not only oral sex, but also open mouth kissing was associated to the development of oral HPV infection. Essentially, and especially considering the more recent focus on the microbiome, we're all mobile bags of bacteria, some good and some bad. Another study titled Case Control Study of Human Papillomavirus in Oral Pharyngeal Cancer, which incorporated participants from Johns Hopkins Hospital, furthermore expands the number of factors associated with oral pharyngeal cancer. Not only one's lifetime number of oral, but vaginal sex partners, age of sexual debut, not using condoms, and of course, promiscuity, all factors common today. In a separate analysis, this throat cancer was also associated with factors such as poor oral health, as well as tobacco use. Well, all aboard the cancer train. In considering these factors, as well as the disconnect that is rather prevalent when it comes to engaging in oral sex and the potential for disease transmission, potentially leading to cancer down the line, men are not just eating the box, as they say, as many may imagine themselves doing on a Saturday night after having hooked up with a girl at a bar or a club. I do, however, find a box to be an apt analogy here. Whether we're considering its use by a moving company or the promiscuous culture today, while you may find use for the box at a particular time, you never know what was inside of it previously or how many loads it's taken over time. Due to this, while there is a chance that previous uses may affect what you are inserting into the box now, 
perhaps an unknown substance getting on your new toaster, or HPV being transmitted to you orally. As the box doesn't look half bad at first glance, not much thought is given to this. This especially being the case when alcohol and or other mind-altering substances are thrown into the mix. In a sense, you're not just eating the box, but eating the box of cancer. There is an additional potentially harmful consequence of engaging this behavior that comes to mind, but there does not appear to be any research on it. As I covered in the Something in the Water series, synthetic estrogens from the pill are excreted through the vaginal canal by means such as urination. While there are myriad reasons why men's testosterone levels have been on the decline to this diet, I will hypothesize that oral sex may be playing a contributing role. In a practical sense, if synthetic estrogens are passed through the vaginal canal as an excretion method, I do view it as a possibility that men engaging in oral sex, resulting in not only contact with, but swallowing vaginal excretions, may be directly digesting synthetic estrogens and therefore playing a significant role in the contemporary state of men's hormonal dysregulation. I also want to propose a reason for the supposed increase in rates of oral sex involving the anus. Going back to the microbiome, again, for reasons such as diet, but also that antibiotics tend to be passed out like candy, which destroys the good as well as bad bacteria in the body, it should come as no surprise that people so commonly end up with dysbiosis or dysregulation of the bacteria that inhabit places such as the intestines. Interestingly, a more recent technology has been that of the fecal microbiota transplant, which takes the fecal matter of a donor with a healthy microbiome to introduce elements of it into the microbiome of someone facing some form of health condition. One comedian I recall joking about his engaging in this form of oral sex, wherein he stated that if the woman is attractive, he is more than willing to do this. I found this interesting as, to be found attractive, one must possess traits such as clear skin and essentially no signs of disease, traits on some level indicative of a more balanced and therefore healthier microbiome. For instance, much of your biotin, which contributes to hair growth, is actually generated by intestinal bacteria, and the ratio of good to bad bacteria is going to be contingent on factors such as your diet. Notably, this is part of why people get addicted to bad food. The bad bacteria that thrive on bad foods hijack your mind in order to provide themselves sustenance, so you get cravings that induce post hoc rationalizations to pursue your favorite snacks. By this framework, I will also hypothesize that if rates of this form of oral sex have increased, it is a consequence of people having become, essentially, microbiome wastelands. As the average microbiome has been heavily dysregulated by factors such as poor diet, as well as perhaps antibiotics, although as a bit more of a direct approach than the fecal microbiome transplant, and surely less safe, there has been an increase in people engaging in this form of oral sex with more attractive people, unbeknownst to them as their mind is associating attractive features with a robust microbiome in order to achieve a more regulated microbiome. But regardless of whatever you enjoy doing on a Saturday night, this video is not to assert that people should not have sex. My thoughts on this subject are far from that of John Harvey Kellogg and his pursuit of enforcing abstinence. As with any of my videos, however, my goal is to provide education so that people can make better decisions in the future.